Good morning, saints. Welcome, welcome. Hey, Ann, how you doing, sister? I'm well, I'm doing well. I know, distant, virtual, yes. <laughs> welcome, everybody. Hallelujah, welcome. We have people here. We have people out in the Facebook world. Welcome to you all, too. Uh, so good, good that you would want to spend time with us and worshiping God together as a family, you know. And we look forward to uh, the time where we can all get together in, in the same space sometime in the future, God willing. But there's another time we're going to get together, too. You are a child of the Most High God. Amen. That marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be a, such a great, great celebration. Amen. When we all get to heaven, as they say, <laughs> crossing the Jordan. Amen. Thank you so much, great God, for gathering us here today. We want to give you praise today. We are Faith Outreach Community Church. I know that I feel joy in my heart that I want to sing. And I, I don't uh, expect everybody out there to have that same kind of joy, and I challenge you especially if you know who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And even if you're going through some stuff right now, praise him, amen. Give him glory. You know, you know who he is, amen. And I know people go through trials and then tribulation, but you still want to praise him, amen. You praise through it, amen. I have joy in my heart. I, it's not a challenge for me right now. I understand. But I do understand sometimes it's like this. We are in the presence of the Most High God, no matter where you are right now. Let's give him praise, church. Come on. Here we go. Lord, we've come to worship you. We've come to lay down our lives at your feet. We've come to honor you and all. to worship you yes you're worthy to lay down our lives at your feet yes we've come to honor you and offer you our praise <laughs> lord we've come to worship you we've come to lay down our at your feet, living sacrifices. We come to honor you and offer you our praise, Lord. We've come to worship you. We've come to lay down our lives at your feet. We've come to honor you and offer Come on, give it praise. So our hands go up and our hearts go up and our voices rise with a glorious shout. We're delighted to sacrifice everything. Yes, Lord, you give it all to us. And we give it all back to you. May we have magnified it tenfold, praising you. Voices rise with the glory show. We're delighted to sacrifice everything to honor you and offer you. To honor you and offer you. To honor you and offer you. Father, receive this offering. Lord, we agree that you are worthy. That's why we give you everything. Father, receive our worship. Father, receive this offering. Lord, we agree that you are worthy. That's why we 
Good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, let us pray. Eternal Father God, we are so grateful and so thankful, Lord, that you privileged us to be able to stand before your presence today, that you brought us safely through another week, Heavenly Father. Amen. And despite the, the chaos and all of the pandemonium that's going on around us, Heavenly Father, in more ways than one, you so graciously allowed us, Father, to be able to see this day. A whole lot of people who may have seen last Sunday may not have seen this Sunday. But Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you spared our lives, that you watched over us and kept us. And we are thankful, Lord, that we can stand before you and give praises to your name, to listen to your word brought to us, Father, by our pastor, who you have grace with the just the right words we need to hear, Father. And we are so grateful for this. Father, we ask your blessing upon all those who are meeting before you today, whether they're streaming or they're live or whichever way, Heavenly Father. And we just pray that you will watch over them, pray be with our brethren who especially who worship in situations that we almost can't fathom, in countries where the name of Jesus is outlawed, Heavenly Father. And so, but who they come out, Father, and, and uh, trust in you, and they live purely by faith because they don't know if they're gonna go home and their house, house might not be there or if they even survive the service itself. But Father, they trust in you. And so we thank you, Lord, because you love us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice on our behalf. And we just ask, Father, that you, we, you take over our minds and hearts, our imaginations, that to keep our minds on what you're teaching us this day. But again, we thank you for all good things. Be with those, those who are on their way today, Father. Bring them safely. We ask this in the precious and mighty name of our soon coming King, you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Welcome to those on Facebook, YouTube, or who are streaming on our website. We are so blessed to have you with us this morning. I'd like to start out with a prayer request uh, with the Voice of Martyrs International Day of Prayer. The Voice of Martyrs has become one of my passions lately. Uh, FOCC, please join the Christians around the world for a day of global prayer. On Sunday, November 1st, Christians around the world will join in prayer for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. The Voices of Martyrs suggest 10 ways to pray during the month of November, and you can certainly pray, start praying these prayers for them now. Uh, I would like to give you five this week and another five next week. Pray our persecuted families will, number one, sense God's presence. Number two, know we are praying for them. Three, experience God's comfort. Four, see God open doors to evangelism. And five, boldly share the gospel. Those are the first five, and these are ways that we can pray for them. Sometimes we wonder, how can we pray for the persecuted Christians? These are the first five ways that we can do. And like I said, next week I'll give you the last five. Uh, if you would like for weekly prayer updates, you can visit icommittopray.com. icommittopray.com. Under general announcements, we have a prayer request form. We now have a prayer request form on our website. If you have a prayer request you want to submit, please fill out the form and it will be routed to the appropriate person. So we now have that available. And as I always mention, we need to continue to slow the spread of COVID-19. As a reminder, COVID-19, as you are aware of, and the, there is an uptick now, they're talking about a second wave uh, throughout the world, is still here, and anyone can be affected. Please continue to pray for those who have lost loved ones to the virus, 
those who are being treated for the virus and all those on the front line in the treatment of the virus. Please continue to wear a mask, practice social distancing, wash your hands, and stay at home if you are sick. Let's keep one another safe and healthy. Today's sermon is entitled, Now, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? It will be given to us by Pastor Wade Belcher. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Those sharing our services electronically, I want to welcome you also. Enjoying a beautiful fall day. I want to get right into the sermon. We understand the scripture and secular history serve as a reminder of God's relationship with his creation. Humanity feels that God has given them a free hand in world affairs with little or no direct intervention from God. If you are a person of faith, a believer, you know that God is ever present and intervenes as it serves his purpose and plan. Let's start with the mixed multitude. Now, we're going to go through these fairly quickly, but most of these scriptural references, you are very familiar. The mixed multitude that came out of Egypt, they were on the way to meet God in the wilderness. They had witnessed the miracles, dealing with the plagues against Egypt and their deliverance, yet there were doubts. In Exodus 14, verses 10 through 14, read this very quickly. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would, be, would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people by saying, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance of the Lord, the, the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight to you, fight for you. You need only stand still. Let's approach the throne of grace and remind ourselves that God is still the same. We say he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father in heaven, we come before you, thanking you for the opportunity to gather together. Though we're small in numbers, uh, numbers don't really matter to you. It's just that we are to be witnesses to, of your goodness, witnesses of your intervention in our lives, intervention in the lives of all that you've created. You've not left us alone. You have provided us with all that we need. All we need to do is to heed. I'll ask you to guide my thoughts, guide those who hear. They'll understand and be reassured that you are always with us. You have not abandoned us. And despite the circumstance, including the ones we're dealing with now, you're still in charge. Father, we surrender to you and ask you to help us that all things that we say, do, and hear will be guided by you, that you, Holy Spirit, will give us the illumination that we need, that we truly may be prepared to be lights in this world and take the word in our activities and in our lives though we may, that we may be witnesses for you. We thank you and ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God gave us assurances in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 56 through 51, of 61. 
It says, Praise be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel as he has promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he never leave us or forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him to walk in all his ways and to keep the commands, decrees, regulations he gave our fathers. And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may uphold the cause of his servant and cause of his people Israel according to each day's need, so that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no other. But the hearts, but your hearts must be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this time. During the time of the prophets, Elijah was used by God to open his people's minds. Then God chose to take Elijah away. Elijah was chosen by God to succeed Elijah. Elijah had been given, had been with Elijah for some time and saw that God was with him, but now that God had taken Elijah, he needed to know that God was still there. Have we ever been discouraged? You know, where's God? And hopefully, this is just a reminder. God hasn't gone anywhere. In 2 Kings, 2 chapter, verses 13 and 14, this is back to Elisha. He picked up the cloth that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water. said, where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. I'll add in, on dry land. Sounds familiar? God's still in the business. Later, Elijah was in the service of God, but these were also times of trouble. In 2 Kings, 6th chapter, verses 15 through 17, when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was about the city. <clears throat> Elisha's servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Elijah answered, Fear not, for those with us are more than those with them. Then Elijah prayed, Lord, I pray you, open the eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Amen. Go further. In Hebrews 13, chapter, verses 5 through 8. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, because he's God. We have many examples of believers who trusted God regardless of the circumstances. Joseph, betrayed by his jealous brothers, sold into bondage, but he found favor with his human master until the master's wife tested him, then lied on him for rejecting her advances. He was a bondman in prison, but God delivered him to serve his purpose. In Daniel 1st chapter, verses 6 and 7, four young men from Judah, I'll use the Israeli name, Daniel, Hanani, Mishaiah, and Asariah were among those selected. The head of the palace staff gave them Babylonian names which you're probably more familiar. Daniel was named Belshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. 
Mishael was named Meshach, and Azariah was named Abednego. We know their stories. They chose to obey God despite the threat of death. In Daniel 3, verses 8 through 12, just then, some Babylonian fort fortune tellers stepped up and accused the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king, you gave strict orders, O king, that when the big band started playing, anyone, everyone should fall on their knees and worship the gold statue. And whoever did not go to their knees and worship, it had to, they had to be pitched into a roaring furnace. Well, there are some Jews here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who you have placed in high positions in the province of Babylon. These men are ignoring you, O king. They don't respect your, your gods. They won't worship this gold statue you set up. In other words, they were tattling, partly because they were jealous, but they figured they'd get the king to do anything because the king can't go against his own word. In Daniel 8, I'm sorry, Daniel 3, verses 16 through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar, your threat means nothing to us. If you throw us in the fire, the God we serve can rescue us from the roaring furnace and anything else you might cook up. But even if he doesn't, it won't make a bit of difference, O king. We still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the golden statue you set up. We know the story of these men being thrown into the furnace, heated seven times hotter than normal. When the king looked into the furnace, he saw four men walking around in the flames rather than the three he had tossed in. They were released with no ill effects of flames nor smell of smoke on them. We know who else was in there with them. And the king soon found out too. In Daniel 6, verses 6 through 12, the vice regents and governors conspired together and then went to the king and said, King Darius, live forever. We've convened your vice regents, governors, and all your leading officials and have agreed that the king should issue the following decree. For the next 30 days, no one is to pray to any god or mortal except you, O king. Anyone who disobeys will be thrown into the lion's den. Issue this decree, O king, and make it unconditional, as it is written in stone like all the laws of the Medes and Persians. Darius signed the decree. When Daniel learned of this decree, learned it had been signed, he continued to pray, as he always did. In fact, he did it in the upstairs part of the home he was living in with the windows open. So he wasn't hiding. He opened the windows toward Jerusalem and prayed three times a day, thanking and praising God. Of course, the conspirators came and found him praying, asking God for help. They went straight to the king and tattled. They remind him of the royal decree, did you not... They said, sign the decree forbidding anyone to pray to any God or any man except for you for the next 30 days. And anyone caught doing so will be thrown into the lion's den. We know that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. But guess what? He had a good night's sleep with a lion as a pillow and a comforter. <laughs> when the king freed him the next day, the lion's that confronted Daniel when the king had his, the conspirators thrown in, they tore them limb to limb before they even hit the bottom of the den where they were housed. We look at these scriptural references and see God's hand in it. How about now? <clears throat> Our lives are unique. We have experiences as individuals that no one else will have. We are to be living testament of God's impact on our lives. What testimony can we give? Since we've had the stay-at-home regulations, <coughs> had an opportunity to go over my life's experiences 
And for those who know me, say, boy, those must have been some strange experiences. A lot were, but hopefully I've learned. I'll briefly cover several events that you should remember because they were not hidden away. I'll cover my direct or indirect involvement in each event over the span of 30 years, but it's going to be highly compressed. In 1971 and 72, I was sent to our Texas office on a rotational assignment. I worked there with an architect who later became the initial designer and the on-site project manager for the building that would become known as the Oklahoma City Federal Building. The actual design didn't start until the mid-70s when I was back in Washington, but my job was to keep an eye on projects in that regional area and to provide whatever administrative support in terms of budget, project approval, any snafus to try to correct them. One of the big decisions was on the structural system for the building. The initial design considered using structural steel, which has to be milled, rolled, and processed and delivered to the site, which is not unusual. The other choice would be concrete, which requires some steel, but different grades of steel and could be done in a different way. The structural system of this plan had to be altered because at the same time that our Oklahoma City project was to be sent out for bids and construction started, a major manufacturer's assembly plant was to be located in Oklahoma City. Our Oklahoma City federal project was to be about 300,000 square feet. It's not a small building, but compared to others, it wasn't that big. The assembly plant for the man major manufacturer was to be 4 million square feet. So guess where the steel manufacturers would put all of their steel? Someone who would pay cash real fast and go for it. Asking someone to give you a dime's worth versus $50 worth, capitalistic system, they go for the $50. In this case, we knew we had to reevaluate using steel. The building was reconfigured and designed for concrete, which will allow for speedier construction and to be completed within the schedule as well as the budget. Now, after the building was completed, you figure, ah, it's all, all done, maybe. But you probably didn't read about this. In 1983, an extremist group planned to attack the federal building with rockets housed in a van and then do whatever damage. However, one of the group who was assembling the rockets to be used in the attack, the explosive blew up in his hands. They called off the attack. One of those involved later was tried and convicted, and he was scheduled to be executed on a day that we'll get to in just a moment. We will look at other consequences. In 1993, the World Trade Center was bombed using a vehicle loaded with explosives driven into the lower level of one of the Twin Towers and detonated. This was, there was significant damage and there were six people killed. The reaction included an analysis of how and what happened and how future events would be prevented. This was something that many of us, we, we could see coming because there were so since 1975 through 1995, there are approximately 43 bombings in the United States. You don't hear about many of them because they weren't necessarily you know, front page news, but lots of damage, some casualties, not too many fatalities, but enough. The threat was still there. But this is just in the United States. 
around the world, there were other bombings that were worse. Since there was a major federal presence at the World Trade Center complex, I got to know the structural engineer who designed the World Trade Center and the director of security who was charged with the building's repairs and modifications to building operations. Unofficial analysis suggests that if the vehicle had been parked closer to one of the main columns or in direct contact with a column a few feet away, there would have been more significant damage. Whether it would cause collapse, we don't know. But speculation is damage would have been much greater and there have been a lot more casualties. Many will say we were lucky. But then, on April 19, 1995, I'm preface by saying the day that one of the former conspirators who wanted the rocket attack was scheduled to be executed, the Oklahoma City Federal Building was bombed. Several supporting exterior columns were destroyed and parts of the building collapsed. Of the approximate 650 occupants of the building, 168 were confirmed dead. Analysis shows that the building design allowed for the force of the blast to be partially absorbed. In other words, in other words the building, in effect, racked, racked around the exterior stair well in the back of the building so it wasn't directly damaged but it was able to hold the integrity of the building further speculation said that if the building had been designed using steel the extent of the damage and possible total or greater collapse and loss of life would be possible another coincidence and this is if from just my perspective, my job, being asked, you know, what, what are you going to do about it? After capture the one of the perpetrators, and I'm not going to use their names, I'm not going to honor them with that, revealed that he wanted to use what was called a shape chart, those who've ever been in the military. There's a purpose in that. But it would have required the explosives to be forming a U-shape in the back of the van. I said, well, what's wrong with that? The weight distribution possibly would have caused the van to flip over or caused the rear axle to break, so he didn't use it. And the difference in the shape charge and the charge that he actually detonated, the shape charge would have been 25 to 40 percent more effective, meaning damage greater collapse and death toll would have been assured. But you wonder about that. Well, what's that got to do with anything? It didn't happen. I said, well, the, uh, the bridge didn't fall on me. Yeah, but these are things that we know could have happened. And there's enough evidence that that was the intent. But the same way God intervenes throughout the scripture, he's still doing it now. Now, to go further, when the announcement of the bombing was sent out, TV, we were able to locate a TV close enough to go down and see the video, and we knew the damage was going to be extensive. Because at that time, I'd been assigned to head a technical group handling building requirements to determine how do you design, how do you build, how do you ensure the safety of the building. The child care center in the Oklahoma City building, which was on the side where the, the truck was placed, was designed by one of my architects. So we knew that there was little chance of the kids surviving, but some did. Then it became more personal a few months later after being on a working group assigned by the president, he gave us 60 days to come up with an answer, and not just to this, answer to everything that he could possibly think of. And unfortunately, 
when the President of the United States give, gives your boss orders, guess who gets it? You get a chance to either do it or find someone else. But most of us were determined, we're going to find an answer. But after that, we had an interagency and industry working group meeting in Washington to come up with some of our preliminary results. And at that meeting, we had some guests to spur us to do better. Many of you remember some of the videos and photographs from the Oklahoma City bombing. One that sticks in my mind is the photograph of the firefighter holding the little baby girl, Miss Bailey, in his arms. She didn't survive. But during this planning session, I had, along with several other people, we had to talk to Bailey's mom and the firefighter because they want to tell us face to face what you need to do to try to prevent this. They didn't scream, rant, rave. They just said, do your best to make sure this doesn't happen. Now, we can't guarantee anything, but what could we do? We assemble experts from all over the world, mostly here in the United States, and included in that was the structural engineer from the World Trade Center and the director of security at the Trade Center. We started to see what could be done on existing buildings and on new buildings. Things were going along slowly, deliberately, you know, not that much you know, real accomplishing. But then September 11th, 2001 occurred. When the first plane hit the towers, the director of security was part of the transition team to turn the complex over to new owners and a new security director. He was there to show the incoming security guy the ropes. He and the assessor were outside of the building. That's the first building that was hit. When that was hit, they went into the second tower. That's the one that was hit by the plane coming in lower. They went in there to coordinate the evacuation of the facility. They didn't make it out. Their bodies were recovered several days later. In fact, there were frantic emails going all over the world. Have you seen them? Because there were rumors, you know, you saw them here, maybe they were there. But then when the bodies were recovered, that was another sobering effect because same as when we met uh, Ms. Bailey's mom and the firefighter, I was telling the pastor, that was a gut check. Are we going to be serious? And we think about it, are we going to be serious as Christians? Are we going to do what God commands us to do? Or are we going to play at it? And we're all going to have to have an experience so we can relate to others saying, my life is a living testament, testament of God working in my life. And that's something we have to be able to say in a way where it's an affirmation. Yes, I am. It's not bragging. We're just saying God allowed me to do this because it's God doing it, not me, but I am the witness. And despite a lot of second guessing, was something that was touching also the structural engineer. He's a few years young, a few years older than I am. He's, last time I checked, he's still alive. He still was warning, could I have done something differently? Could I have done it better? And many of, yeah, yeah I'm not going to tell the structural engineer who was you know, world famous, well, you should have done this. We just have to reassure him, you did the best job you could given the facts involved. Because if you think about it, when that plane went in, both planes went in, it destroyed many of the columns in the building. The aviation fuel soaked all the floors that were impacted. Aviation fuel burns. It, it, no matter what you have in there, it will burn if it has enough fuel soaking it up. 
the walls and, ce and ceilings partially collapsed and added to the fuel load. The impact of the plane, especially the wings, broke the pipes that serviced the sprinklers, which means no sprinkler protection, so there was no way to control the fire. Everything was working against the integrity of the building. It was distressing to discuss the building's performance with the structural engineer because he said, there must have been something. We kept saying, no. Because if you can think about it, people were able to get out. Not everybody, but the majority of the people were able to get out. They were able to get home that night. I know I'm talking to my, one of my nieces. They had to walk from lower Manhattan all the way to New Jersey. Which you said the choice was staying in Manhattan. And I went there a couple of weeks later and you barely could breathe. You could have all the masks on you want to, but just the, just, just the smell and the dust was still in the air. If you look at the photographs just before the second building collapsed, the four floors above the impact area started to tip over. That's the first one. You may not be able to see it clearly. It was tipping over almost 20 degrees. That should have fallen over. With that much tonnage, several hundred thousand tons of building. But as the building started to collapse, it pulled the building back over and it fell straight down. Anybody who knows anything about physics, that's not supposed to happen, but it did. The structural engineer said, well, the, the resilience of the structural steel, maybe, but I'll put my, my trust in God because we don't worry about anything else because if that building had tipped over, speculation that it may have tipped over enough to knock another building over. Now, I can't prove this because after a while I said, no, I'm not even going to go there. Several blocks away to keep on going where you had had damage you would not believe, but it didn't. The damage was significant enough, but it came straight down. They say, that's another coincidence, right? Yeah. Closer to home that day, American Airlines Flight 77 crushed, crashed into the Pentagon. The Pentagon was undergoing renovations, including structural and security issues, many that were under consideration by our interagency working group to upgrade the Pentagon building. Portions of the building were worked on over a certain period of time so they can maintain operations. The wedge that was hit by the plane was under renovation with only a small percentage of people normally in that part. Unfortunately, a young woman whose sister was one of my coworkers for over 25 years she had just transferred into the Pentagon from another part of defense. She didn't survive. And the occupants of the adjacent wedge, the part that had been upgraded for the walls and the windows, many walked away or easily were rescued. Many credited the upgrades to the walls and windows for their survival. Several months later, I worked with the then deputy project manager who was handling the Pentagon project. And we talked about many other stories of survivors. Many don't want to talk about, which I can fully understand because talk about the trauma. I was 10 feet away when that wing went through. I'm spared. What do I do? You better tell somebody that God was there with you. Many coincidences, or I should say, how many coincidences do we need to be assured that God is still involved in our lives? He promised, his promises are true. We can and must trust him regardless of the situation, circumstances, or consequences. I suggest you examine your life. Look closely at consequences. 
narrow escapes, blessings, corrections, overcome trials. When someone says, I was lucky, remember God's hand does not contain luck. Amen. His mercy overwhelms us in ways that we better tell somebody. Because without, yeah, we, we look at what goes on around now. We're here. We're not acting foolishly, but we're here. By God's grace, we're here. We ask that God be merciful to those who've lost loved ones, who are undergoing a trial of having to go through this. But remember, God is still in charge. Because we have to keep in mind in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do you believe this? Do you trust his word? Do you commit your life to him? Well, let's thank him. Father in heaven, we look to you and thank you for your mercy, for your love, for your goodness, for being our strong arm for being our shield, for being our shelter, for being our God, knowing that without you, we would not exist. We would not do anything because only by your will can we even move. Father, we surrender to you and thank you and ask for your continued mercy to be with us and help us as your people to take our lives as living sacrifice and tell somebody about that sacrifice of why we do it. We take credit for nothing and give you all honor and praise. Father, we ask you to also be with us this time. We be sure act of praise and worship the offering that we give to you that we may be able to take your word to more than just those we come in immediate contact with, but that we do it with effectiveness, that you will multiply its effect, that everything will be done to your honor and glory. We surrender to you and thank you. Ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. That was a wonderful message. We really appreciate that. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. God is using our, our, our clergy in so many wonderful ways, and especially to be able to expound the word and to, to, to you know, bring it home. Amen. Amen. Land in the plane, as they say. Thank you, Pastor. Hallelujah. Wow. Let's stand and give him praise, Lord. God, we just want to give you praise after we heard that word of encouragement. Amen. Powerful, mighty, holy God. Amen. And we walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. You walk on this floor, you don't think the floor is going to fall. How much more powerful will your God uphold you in time of trials? Amen. Come on. He's a mighty God. Come on, church. 
provided everything we need. We're his friend. Come on. Yes. He's a mighty God, powerful and holy God. He's a mighty God, powerful and holy God. Yeah. He's a mighty God, powerful and holy God. He's a mighty God, mighty, mighty. Will we wrestle not against flesh His words. Come on, church. Let's talk about him now. Come on. Powerful, mighty, and holy King of Kings. His name is worthy. Holy One, the Lord of Glory, Mighty God. Yes, He's a mighty God. Mighty and holy King of Kings. His name is worthy. Holy One, the Lord of Glory. Oh, let me hear your Facebook. Let me hear you. Come on. Powerful. and holy king of kings his name is worthy holy one the lord of glory mighty god he's a mighty god powerful mighty and holy king of kings his name is worthy holy one hey come on church oh land the plane come on powerful yeah king of kings holy one hey he is he's a mighty god He's a mighty God, powerful, oh, he is, King of Kings, Holy One. Don't you worry about a thing. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Don't you worry about a thing. Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Wade, for that wonderful message. You know, Pastor Wade has a unique perspective. Uh, being an engineer, you know, it's like speaking Greek to all of us, but when you understand how buildings are constructed and what could happen, I never thought about it, and we, could, and we ought to have thought about it, how those buildings could have fallen and the damage that could have been done in New York City and all the other circumstances that uh, passed away that were not just coincidences. You know, we just got to, how many times do we need to remind ourselves that God is in control, that God is in charge. Nothing happens outside of his control, outside of his care, outside of his will. It's going to happen in spite of us. God is doing something. And all we need to do is just sit back and let him do it. Amen. So don't you fret. Don't you worry. Don't you care. Don't you. Be, you have nothing to be concerned about. 
God got all of this. He got all of this. And when you get to heaven, Jesus said, wait, 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 wait. But Corona, you, oh, that took you by surprise. Well, let me tell you, I had this all laid out. I had this all laid out. So there's nothing to fret. And I think, Pastor, because of your uh, the gifts and the knowledge and ability that the Lord has given to you, I thank you for sharing that with us today. I uh, thank you for blessing us with uh, your, the word. Amen. Amen. Good to see all of you, all of you today. I know y'all just kind of rolled in here. I looked back. There were three people in lo and behold. Well, maybe it was maybe one, maybe maybe four. I don't know. <laughs> and lo and behold, look up. Don't you worry about a thing, right? <laughs> it's good to see everybody. And I understand that uh, Vivian gave a similar message at uh, women's ministry yesterday, right? I heard about that too. My wife couldn't stop talking about it. Amen. God is good. Boy, I can sit and say that God is good, God is good, God is good. And constantly need to be reminded that God has control over our lives. Wow, what a blessing that is. Join me in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you so much. <laughs> we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you, God in heaven, that you're bigger <laughs> than anything that we can imagine. That nothing in this world happens that's outside of your design and your purpose. Nothing takes you by surprise. Nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens by luck. You are God, and there is none like you. You're God all by yourself. And Lord, we have to constantly remind ourselves that you are God, and we are not. Thank you so much for the word that we heard today. And when we in Embrace it, digest it, and live it. Never forget who you are. And it's really nothing but a lack of faith on our part when we fret about stuff and forget the mighty hand of God. We see it in the scriptures as we heard today over and over and over and over and over again. And Pastor only gave a fraction mm -hmm. of the examples in the scriptures of you showing up and showing out. Mm -hmm. and you not only did it back then, Paul, Almighty God, you did it even today. And you're doing it right now. And we thank you. Oh, God, help us to help us never to forget that. Thank you for being in charge. Thank you for being in control. Thank you for being a mighty God. Awesome God. Awesome ruler. We ask that you will help us to internalize that in our thinking and in our hearts. Bless us throughout this week. And may we never forget it and live it. And saints, as you go forth, go forth knowing that you are a child of God in your every move, in every direction, whether you go in or, or go out, come in or go out, whether you rise up or lay down, God's got you covered every which way. May God be with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. You never take for granted going to the restroom. Amen. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> I tell you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Amen. <laughs>